morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being here. My name is Andre Tilda, I'm Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us here today to learn a little bit more about how, uh, how to be and what it means to be a Carleton FPA student. And to give you some insight into those issues, uh, we have three students here to talk to you about their experiences and answer questions that you may have. So I will introduce all the students first and then turn it over to them. So first, please, I'd like to introduce Crystal, who is a fourth year Bachelor of Communication Media Studies student. Crystal is the incoming president of the Carleton University Filipino Students Association. Eddie is a third year student in the Bachelor of Media Production and Design. And he actually runs a sports blog called 613 Sports. And finally, Ben is also a third year student in the media and production and design program. Ben is co-captain of the Carleton Men's Ultimate Frisbee team. So with that in mind, I'll turn it over to Crystal. All right, hi everyone, my name is Crystal. Um, I'm going to talk about three points um, that would be helpful for you guys to know when coming to Carleton in your first year. So something that I learned in my first year that I found was interesting is that in the program of comms, communication and media studies, I found it interesting how there's so many paths of comms that you can pursue in, in the future. So for example, some paths may be like digital marketing, human resources, public relations, media law, advertising, I, I've done a list, <laughs> journalism, broadcasting, um, public policy, or even like game or web development, like the possibilities like are endless. That's why like I really thought that comms was a really interesting program. And I, because it's really broad, like I think it's a really, it's really beneficial for especially first years to like explore their, explore these different paths and to take um, courses in different, um, I guess like topics or like specialties just to know like what you find interesting and what like, oh, maybe like broadcasting is something that I want to pursue in the future. And then because our program has so many electives, like I think it's really great that um, we have all of these options and so many paths that we can go um, pursue in in the future. Um, another thing that I wanted to, that I that I found interesting was um, that our program has the co-op option. So that's um, you probably already know through like high school, um, but it's yeah, it's just getting that like hands-on experience uh within your program and to have that like designation when you graduate as well so right now i'm in a my first co-op work term um i'm with like health canada and it's it's even though like despite it being a virtual like environment like it's it's good to like show that you're like present and to take like initiative and to try to exhaust the position as much as you can for like with the employer just because like it, it is sort of like a challenge. So it's just important to, I guess, show your potential. Um, and then another point that I wanted to, to bring up is like my favorite extracurricular. So as um, Andre already mentioned, I'm the incoming president of the Filipino Student Association at Carleton. So you don't have to be Filipino to <laughs> join our club, but it is encouraged that you join just like any club um, in general. You meet so many people. There's actually a lot of like opportunities for like networking as well. Um, and it's, it's nice to like, I guess as a, a Filipino, like it's nice to see like my culture represented on campus. And yeah, I would just, still encourage you to like attend or like participate in like events, like club events, whether it be like online or it most likely will be. Sorry, Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and then the one thing that I wish I knew when I started university was all of the like available resources that are on campus. Like I didn't know that Kisa had like 
free printing of like 250 pages like for the whole year like I figured that out in like halfway through my second year and I was like oh my gosh like I really paid money for printing <laughs> um but yeah like resources like that or even like the counseling services for like mental health like it's really important to um to have that and to just like self-care and just like check up on yourself and as well as like the career services which is really important for your career and like developing your um skill sets and for like resume writing and cover letter um building it's I find those resources like the most like helpful for me when I um wish that I wish I knew when I started university um and with that I can pass it on to Ben and Eddie for their sorry <laughs> for their um for their session yeah, so my name's Eddie, and I'm in media production and design third year. And really, the first thing you should know about media production design is that it's such an interesting new program, basically, only three years of it. It basically takes all forms of media Not creation. Three years of it, but there's only been three years. There's so only been three years of it, but it takes all forms of media production of journalism or photography or even just drawing and brings them all together as a new kind of narrative. So in the first year, what you're going to do, you're going to end up actually, I don't know, with COVID, but you will be ending up working with the Natural Museum of History, uh, Museum of Nature in Ottawa, working with stuff like augmented reality. And that's the journalism side. So you're going to learn about how different kinds of medias, pictures, and even writing plays a part in this new kind of world. Uh, and as well, you're going to learn some computer stuff. You're going to learn how to create a website through HTML, so which, which is pretty fun, actually. So you're going to be a lot of people with different kinds of backgrounds. What I noticed really fast was that there are people who are good at drawing, photography, writing, and we all came together as one to help each other. And it's been really, uh, really fun. Um, and as for like extracurriculars, obviously try to do as many clubs, but for sure, like if you're heading to this, you have some kind of hobby related to, to creation, anything, it could be music. Try to see if you can link up what you learn in, in the program into what your hobby is. So for example, me, I like writing and, I created a blog in 2017 and once I got into this program, I was able to increase the volume more by learning how to, you know, make my website look nicer or learning how to write better or learning how to, you know, use graphs or pictures. So if you're able to connect what you learn with something that you like, you can have so many career options moving up. And one thing I wish I knew heading into it, into university was how much free time you actually have compared to high school where your whole day is just basically classes in university your schedule is all over the place. You could have some days where you're in class all day and some days you have one class. So finding time to make sure you do your work, but also have some fun, have free time. You're in university, try different things. You don't have to do work all the time and you're going to have a lot of time to do both. So just make sure you find that balance and learn how to work and university will be the best place for you. I'm Ben. Cool. Yeah, I'm Ben. I'm also third year in media production. Um, Going into the program, there are a couple things that I wish I had understood about it before going into it, and they're not things that made it difficult or hard, but just it would have been nice to know, um, especially just outside the program. I'm doing a minor in film studies. I didn't know really much about how minors worked at Carleton, and with media production, I'm not sure how many of the students in here are in media production, but if you are looking into things like minors, um, our program has 12 required credits um, and most minors require four. So if you're looking for doing a double minor, which I know a lot of journalism and comm students do, um, that's something you need to look into pretty much as soon as you start because minors will take up four credits and 20 credits is the amount of courses you have during four years unless you take extra. So it's difficult to take a double minor if you come into that late. Um, but yeah, um, so Eddie mentioned some of the things that we do in first year in the program. Um, it's such a diverse program in itself. There are so many different things we learn. In second year, we go from web design in the programming to focusing more on data analysis and data presentation. And you learn a lot about how to use data and graphs to tell stories, as well as um, learning how to make sure you aren't being a, like a showing as much like showing any bias in what you're presenting in your writing or studies. 
Um, and we went from working with the Natural History Museum to doing projects for the National Art Center um, across from the Parliament Building. And each group in our program got to select a, a piece of art or just a piece of it. It's very obscure things that they have presented there, but we all had to create a project based around that. And yeah, at Carleton, obviously there's many, many things that students do and use the skills that we learn in our program for clubs. We have two students who do the illustrations and drawings for the Charlton newspaper. And they're very talented draw like artists and where I've worked with them on projects and they've been amazing and just so many different skills that students have are used all over Carleton, not just in our program. Students create, there are like graphic designers who create logos and jerseys for teams on campus. Um, and then outside of that, we have students who have already created um, their own businesses. There's uh, media freelancers that have started a business this summer as Eddie has his blog and works with, uh, what is it Eddie? What's the soccer team in Ottawa that you work with? Athletic Ottawa. Athletic Ottawa. Yeah. Ottawa. And um, yeah, it's a very small program. Um, so getting to know everybody is very, it's a lot easier than say, I don't know, comms has a lot more students and it's, you're not in as much of a confined space with just a few people, but yeah, it's a great program to utilize the different skills that everybody has because everyone comes into it for a different reason. And yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah, we don't have a group chat. Try to make a group chat and get to know people because I know it's going to be harder with online, but if you get to know them, you can actually make a lot of your friends and they can help you with different stuff. You'll never know when. Yeah. I think that's all from us. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, for everybody who's hearing me talk right now, my name is Stephanie. Uh, I'm the event assistant for the Faculty of Public Affairs in the Office of the Dean. I was the one sending you all the emails with regards to registration and things like that. I will also be sending you uh, an email for your feedback and with um, the link to the recording of this session. Uh, so if uh, it cut out or you missed something or if we have questions at the end that we can't get to, uh, then uh, we'll be able to look at that script and answer those questions with the email. Okay, without further ado, we are going to enter our question and answer section. So anybody who would like to ask a question can write it in the chat function. I will read it out and one of our ambassadors will answer the question. You can ask all the ambassadors or you can single out uh, an ambassador based on uh, what they said in their experiences or based on their program. Uh, so just to uh, recap, um, Crystal is in communication and Ben and Eddie are in media production and design. I'd like to also mention that you please keep the questions to experiences and what you think about transitioning to university. Uh, any questions about getting into specific courses or what courses would fit you best would be good for an academic advisor. Uh, everybody's experiences are different for university. Uh, so definitely utilize your academic advisors on campus. Uh, you can find them based on uh, going to the Carleton uh, website and being able to go from there to book an online appointment with them. All right, so in the chat right now, we don't have any questions. However, we did have some questions in a previous session uh, that I feel were good for everybody to know. So I'm going to ask a couple questions to start it off to all of our ambassadors here today. So how do you find the workload in person versus online? I mean, I, I can take it from my experience doing summer courses this year um, and comparing it to how it felt just during the semester and how that was and the end of second semester. It's, for me, it, it really depends on the environment I create for myself. Um, going into class is, it's very similar to what I, like, you're used to in high school. You, not in the timing, but you're in class, you're doing your work there. That's how it works. And then when you're home, it's just, I, I find it really important that you create an environment that allows you to feel like you're in a place where you need to get work done. For instance, like when I was, I had to go home to my family home back in Niagara and I felt have, it was very difficult for me to get anything done unless I had like 
I was closed off in a room by myself. And now that I'm back in Ottawa, I feel like I have my own space that I can get work done. So as long as you have the ability to create that environment for yourself, it's doable and the workload isn't too much, but it's very, very, you have to work on managing it a lot more than you do when it's going into class. Yeah, for online, it's, I would say it's kind of the workload kind of easier than going to class because, you know, you have transportation and after sitting in class versus just actually doing the work you're given and stuff. Like Ben says, though, you need, you need to find a place where you can actually do it because it's, it's very easy to still lay it off because it might seem easy, but once you start doing it, it's like, all right, I might need to put some time. So you just put enough time every day and you'll have the rest of the day to do whatever you want, basically. Yeah, and then just to, to build on um, Ben and Eddie, it's it's just really important to, I guess, like have a like a set schedule. Um, I guess you'll have to, yeah. I guess like for me, I have to. I usually like like working in like a, the library, like the fifth floor, like the silent floor. So I need to like be closed off, like in a room by myself with my laptop, just like focused. So. And then I have like my set schedules of like, okay, I'll like work or I'll do like work from like this time to this time. And then I'll take like a break. It's really important to take breaks too. Like you don't want to um, like stress yourself out or just like overwhelm yourself with like all the things that you have to do. So it's just really important to, again, like take care of yourself too. And like self-care is really important as well. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, go ahead, Ben. <laughs> I just haven't mentioned that. I, I don't know how to answer the question, but I think Crystal might know how to answer the question. Oh, the, the question in the chat? Mm -hmm. So uh, for those who can't see the chat, just in case, Moon is asking, other than communicator position in government jobs, would you give me more ideas which part of government job I can do after graduating begins slash communication and media? Is that like a, a, a double major, like begins and comms? Or? Well, there is a communicate world communication specialization within begins. We've had a few students uh, coming out of the begins program last year who kind of did those types of issues. So somebody now working, for example, for Heritage Canada, there's somebody working in indigenous relations, doing both research and some more uh, communication stuff. And of course, there are other people who are more tied close to what uh, internet foreign affairs is doing. Uh, and so those are the kind of the basic areas where people in government, uh, where some begin students have found employment uh, in government after the degree over the last few years. Yeah, that I, I didn't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I know that, um, what is it? Well, for like, from my experience, I'm working with like Health Canada right now. So it's, it isn't related to like, communication specifically, but like the work that you're doing can definitely like transfer like the skills that you've been um, developing throughout like your undergrad, and you can like, easily transfer those skills into, I guess, like that department. Um, I know some of my friends, they work in like, I think, yeah, what Andre mentioned as well as like immigration and policy. Um, uh, there's also, what is it? Yeah, public affairs, um, HR as well. There's so many different like departments and like branches with, within those departments um, that would probably like best fit like the or like intertwine well with um, begins and like communication and media studies and uh, Kisa yeah Kisa oh, means the me. <laughs> oh sorry that was, that was me sorry oh, okay. uh, in one of your session experiences um, I think it was actually Crystal uh, you said Kisa about the printing of the pages and just in case some of you don't know that acronym uh, Kisa does mean Carleton University Students Association uh, so you could find them on the web and if slash when we're all on campus, they're on the fourth floor at the university center. And also if and when we're back on campus, Crystal also mentioned that the fifth floor of the university is a quiet floor for those of you who uh, want that bit of insight and like a quiet place to study. That is the place for you to be. Oh, sorry. It's the fifth floor of the, the library. 
that oh did I say university center yeah <laughs> <laughs> I meant the library thank you <laughs> it's a really nice floor lots of sunlight oh yes all right so we don't have any uh, more questions in the chat but I do have another one for you guys what are the differences between a lecture tutorial and discussion class um, for us in MPAD we have um, we have our lectures and tutorials which are normally combined into like a three and a half hour block, a three and a half hour class with a little break in the middle. So the lectures are where we'll have like the prof at the front of the class and they'll be going through their, their slideshow or whatever content they have for us at that point. And you learn and then um, you take a little break and then the tutorials are when we do the hands-on things based on what we were taught because our program is so applicable to them hands-on with most of what we're learning. We do a lot more tutorials than lectures for our programming courses. We, most of what we have is going through code and going through our content with the prof as he's teaching us. Um, so it's, it, it's strange for our program because our lectures aren't really, we don't really have lectures. We, it's almost all tutorial based. We're, we're learning hands-on as we're learning the content right away. And discussion groups, I, we don't have discussion groups for courses in our program, but for electives and most other courses, like for anything I'm doing with my minor, discussion groups are like separate classes that are normally shorter with less students where you can have one-on-one -on -one interaction with the TA and talk about things that you learned in the class that week. And I find those actually probably are the most helpful to learning, they reinforce the important things that the prof goes over in the lecture, and yeah, that's yeah. Lectures time. usually are like you're taking electives like business or film. Like you will notice, lectures are in big lecture halls with a lot of people there, and it's just really you listening to the prof and taking notes. Versus tutorials, which is more hands-on, it you can actually talk to the prof; they can come help you. So for media production, like Ben said, because we're such a small program, most of our lectures turn into tutorials because we can just ask a question and we can actually apply. Um, especially with the computer part, uh, where, we, where we do have a lecture with a prof teaching us coding and tutorial, we actually get to practice it and the prof can come and help us. You can talk with your friends and try to figure it out. So tutorials are a lot more beneficial, I feel, for hands-on, but lectures are more for the theory kind of lessons where you just take notes and have to memorize stuff like that. Uh, for comms, the, the, yeah, the lectures, I would say... Um, you get more of them in your first two years. Um, and then going in, well, I'm going into my fourth year, but like once I hit like third year, I'll, I'll, most of my courses, they became like tutorials, just like smaller um, classes, which I prefer because that way you'll be able to like interact more with the prof and um, with your other classmates. Um, there's more, I guess like, activities and it's just more engaging that way whereas lectures in like your first two years you're just kind of yeah taking notes not as interactive because there's one um one prof and then like more than a hundred of you like all in the like sitting in like this giant lecture room um and then our program has more discussion groups which are I guess very similar to tutorials, but I guess you guys, Ben and Eddie, have more tutorials than discussion groups. We mainly have um, discussion groups where, yeah, we, um, they're smaller groups where we basically go over the, the lecture content. So usually it's like the lecture first and then the discussion group is either like right after the, the lecture or like it depends like, which times you you choose your discussion group for and then yeah it's like I think it's like 15 minutes small group of students in your program and then you'll be able to like go over the lecture content in case you uh, miss something or if you want like to see like seek any like clarification on the content so that's it's really helpful and especially like in your first like few years of um, the program and Stephanie is it okay that I Answer yeah, the... So Abigail is asking Crystal, what are exams like for communications and media? Yeah, so I guess this is similar to what I said about like the, from like 
the first and second year of comms like it's very I guess theoretical it's very I guess like content heavy so the exams are mostly like multiple choice um you do get like your short answer and long answer but I feel like as you go into like your second and third year it gets more um open-ended like you'll be able to like elaborate more on uh the like the short answers and short answers long answers and essay questions you'll be able to like I guess to score more points that way by like further elaborating your points. Whereas like in first year, a lot of the exams were just like multiple choice. So you, there was like no room to like elaborate <laughs> and yeah, and then, like just explain your ideas. Um, so I personally, I find that a lot easier like to, um, write more just because once you have it like in your head and like you've studied you've um done what you can and then once you like have it in your head and it's time for the exam you just kind of like it all like spills out <laughs> so i find that really um yeah i find i guess yeah it's just personal preference but like i enjoy the the upper year courses more but definitely the first and second year courses are fundamental to build upon that Thank you, Crystal. Um, I also have a question from Luca. So most of the comms courses will be online in fall 2020 due to current situation. Uh, yes, all of them will be. <laughs> all courses on campus um, are to be online uh, last that I heard and knew. Um, so uh, that actually leads into my next question for the ambassadors. And that is, um, what is the best way to contact a professor and to have communications with them in the online environment and with time zones in the back of your mind? Well, they normally set times that they have for office hours where they'll, it's, it's really confusing because what are office hours when you're not going to their office? But um, that's when they set times where you know that they'll be available if you need to email them. But from my experience, um, most profs, that all the profs that I've had for online courses have just been totally fine with you sending them an email saying, hey, can we talk some point tomorrow about this project? And you just give them a little brief explanation of what you want to talk about. And most of them will find 15, 30 minutes during their day where they'll be able to talk to you or just send them an email during their office hours and they get back to you as soon as possible. Yeah, from my experience, professors really answer emails really quickly. Like whenever we've had questions about projects, we just email them and usually within like 30 minutes, an hour, they have an answer. And if you need to talk more, you, you can like Ben say schedule like an online meeting through Zoom or something and you can discuss. So it's really, it's really easy. They're really easy people to talk to and they can really help you. It's honestly easier now that we're online to talk to them. <laughs> And always remember that professors are people. <laughs> They're there to help you. They don't mind answering questions. They are fantastic. I had another question in the chat. Uh, just uh, Oswin asked if there's any news in terms of the winter term. Um, as far as we know, not yet, but you will receive an email when it is determined. Uh, so just remember that your emails are your best friends. That's where you're gonna get a lot of the communications um, about club expos, orientation, and about what's going on with the current world situation and the university. I just want to add to that, that we have made arrangements in the Faculty of Public Affairs so that any student in first year in a program offered by the Faculty of Public Affairs will be able to do their first year completely online if that's what they want. So that essentially we're already planning for winter 2021 to make sure that first year students can do the course, uh, courses and complete and stay up in their program uh, by reigning uh, online for that period. I can answer Roshani's question. So Roshani's uh -huh. question is, what should I prepare or expect before classes begin in media production and design? Um, so personally, because it's such a broad program, 
many like most of us come in with a main interest in like one or two of the four things that were being taught for the majority of the year. Um, the way I prepared myself is I didn't know anything about programming whatsoever before coming into the program. So I learned and got just a basic understanding for um, what we were learning HTML, which is just web design. So I didn't teach myself how to do web design, but I taught myself how like just kind of the general idea of what coding is because I really did not know. Um, but if you do know coding, obviously don't do that. I'd say the main thing is just be ready to do a couple of things that you weren't or that you don't really know or didn't exactly expect from exactly what you're learning because um, it's so broad and you're learning so many different things in the first semester, especially that it's yeah, you just got to be open to a very wide array of things. And there is, Eddie, there isn't animation, I don't believe. No. There. Yeah, we, there's IMD in first year where you learn the, like some general ideas about character design and um, story design in games and things like that. But no, we don't actually learn how to animate um, 3D characters or anything like that. No. Yeah, basically come in with an open mind because you're going to be doing anything you could think of really related to media production. Like we ended up doing like an augmented reality. None of us knew what to do, but it was fun. You end up writing, you coding. So anything you think, you, you like Ben said, you probably have like a main thing you want to do. I want, I was coming in like, I want to do writing. And now I'm like, you know, like video creation is something I learned now. And this is something pretty cool. So just come with an open mind and just, have fun trying the new things. Perfect. So actually the next question in the chat was basically answered in that uh, first question. So Victor asked, is there any course that teaches animation? And uh, Ben said, uh, not currently, um, but you can talk to an academic advisor and uh, see what- There are uh, courses we have with the IMD program um, in first year where you learn basics, but the IMD program is the one that students actually do learn about animation. There you go. I hope that helps, Victor. All right, so Abigail has another uh, question for Crystal. So were the multiple choice exams and such in first year, the ones where all the responses are somewhat correct and you have to choose the best answer, uh, just like similar to the AP classes in uh, high school, or are they not that tough? Also, what are you looking to do after you graduate from cons? Yeah, so with the multiple choice exams, you will have those, like those answers where it's like, oh, B and C, A and D, none of the above. So it's really important to like be conf to yeah, to, to build your confidence and to be confident in your answers especially in, it was my, I think my second year, um, it was communication theory course. It was, it was really tough, not gonna lie. Um, we had, um, what is, it? I think every like two, three weeks we had like a quiz. And then, yeah, they were all multiple choice. And then our prof, like, yeah, we had um, options like those and it was really, really tough, but it's, yeah, it's important to, know what you're studying, seek clarification when you need it, go to your prof's office hours, they will help so much. Like, I, I don't know how, I don't know how I would have, what, I, what the result would have been if I wouldn't have, like, asked all those questions. And it's also, also good to ask questions. Like, no matter, like, how many questions, like, I'm one of those people who just boom, boom, boom. Like, <laughs> I think that's really important to just, be confident in knowing your content material. And for the second question that you had, what am I looking to do after I graduate? I'm really interested in like digital marketing. I'm really interested in wanting to like help a company like grow. And just to, I'm really interested in like the, I guess like the background work of how I guess like clients or like consumers like engage with the websites like um, 
for example, if it's like a service, like how many people like engaged with or like clicked on certain things, um, where these people are accessing the website from, like I'm really interested in like, like the Google Analytics, like the AdWords, digital marketing, stuff like that. So I guess that's something that I'm, yeah, I'm wanting to pursue in the future. Yeah, to talk about uh, task space, the best strategy really is study with other people because everyone has different perspectives of the lessons and that they have different ideas. So if you study people, you can all put together your ideas. And it usually, if you study the, the test, some may be difficult, but you'll you'll do fine on tests because the notes are all based off lectures. So if you study with a lot of people, you're going to get a lot of ideas and you can all make a study sheet and it will really help you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So uh, in the chat, we had a question that was answered by the Dean also in the chat. So Kelsey asked, can you have a minor of film studies while studying global international studies? And the Dean has answered, yes, it is possible to do a minor in film studies while studying in global and international studies program. Kelsey has also asked after that um, how she's able to do that because uh, she tried. Um, and it didn't seem to work. Uh, so that, that can happen as well. Uh, so the Dean has also written, <laughs> you can only enroll in the minor once you've started your program. You cannot apply for admission to a minor from high school. So once you're in the program, say partway through your first year, you can talk to an academic advisor and get into the film studies minor. So this is due to the fact that in order to get to a minor, you have to have a certain CGPA at the university and you can't have a CGPA until you have grades. So partway through, halfway through your first year, that first semester, you will have grades. So uh, just to uh, give a reason behind that. From okay. my experience, because I, I am doing a film minor, I'm not in global international studies, but um, I knew I wanted to do a film minor. So if you take film 1001 in your first semester if you can that's what I would say to do and then you can take second year film courses in your second semester and applying for minors super simply just like change program elements or something on Carlton Central it's just like a couple clicks and you apply and when I did it they came back with a response within a day or two and yes yeah you're done uh, yes. Yeah, just, yeah, that's it. Yeah, so for whatever minor you want to do, there's you can always look up the list of courses you need to take. So even if you, you have to wait till your grades come in to officially apply for the minor, if you take those classes right away, it'll, it'll, once you apply for a minor, it'll count. So if you want to be in film studies, if you take film studies right away, once you do apply for the minor, that film studies credit will it'll count for your thing. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you both. All right, so... We do have about six minutes left. Um, there are no questions uh, in the chat right now, but I do have another question. We probably have enough time for one or two uh, medium questions left. So with regards to textbooks, how will I know what textbook I need? And do I need a soft copy, hard copy, or both? Um, well, there, I can't remember what the site's called, but there is a, like, your syllabus will tell you what um, textbooks you need when the syllabus is released for your course. And then, honestly, it's up to you what kind of textbook you want. If you can find an online copy or a digital copy, which is normally a lot cheaper, and you're fine with that, go for it. If you want a hard copy and want to spend money on that, then go for it. It's, it's just as long as you have it and you're able to read it. And, it's all you really need. And yeah, just it'll say in the syllabus for what you need to purchase. I think the website, is it called, is it Slugbooks? Is that it? I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> I okay. just look at the syllabus and then look up the textbook. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, because I think um, Slugbooks is a like, a like a cheaper alternative that you can um, find textbooks on because textbooks can be really expensive. <laughs> Um, but what I, what I do or what I am glad someone told me in my first year is even like Facebook market or Facebook marketplace or like even like the Facebook groups for like the Carlton books. Um, there's so many of them there and then you'll be able, you can literally like search up like the textbook you're looking for and then the results will show up and then you'll be able to, um, coordinate with someone 
meet up on campus <laughs> and then you'll be able to do the like exchange there. Um, also, I, yeah, I prefer getting like just, I mean, I don't mind using like already used textbooks just because they are cheaper and if I'm able to like read them, if I'm able to like still like extract the content from the, those textbooks, then th that'll work like perfectly. Sometimes in the syllabus, um, profs will have the books, like the textbooks available on the, what is it? The library re reserves desk. I'm not sure if that will be available for this. Yeah, they have curbside pickup still for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Some profs so, for us and for my like elective courses, if they say like, make sure you like wait until like, if, if they post the syllabus like, late-ish or even when they do I would say email them and ask them what they do in regards to the readings because I've had a lot of profs and it happened in first year where I purchased textbooks and the profs just ended up posting all of the required readings from the textbooks in pdf form on CU Learn and I spent sixty dollars on something that I just could have clicked on for free so just ask your profs if it's mandatory to purchase it because it'll say it's a mandatory reading and it's a textbook but they might just post it for you to read it's still mandatory to read but you don't need to purchase it mm -hmm. also exactly. our textbooks if you want used ones there is a store near campus called haven's bookstore basically it's all the used textbooks a lot cheaper than than you and it's they're still got copy like they're not like broken or anything but yeah you can get them for pretty cheap prices and and another thing with textbooks is once you're done with them you can always sell to someone there's always people looking for textbooks, like Facebook Marketplace or even friends you know who might be taking class. You can always sell it, so you won't be really losing money. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That is all wonderful advice. Uh, advice that I wish I knew in my first year back in the day, for sure. I spent far too much on new textbooks in my first semester and then found out about the different marketplaces and everything. Uh, just a reminder to anybody uh, making any trades, make sure that the trade is um, legit, is safe, and make sure you stay healthy and social distanced. Um, so another uh, student in the chat, Oswin, asked if there's any suggestions where to find the PDF. So we did get a few answers to that. Uh, Miranda in the chat also mentioned that some of the course materials will be posted online or through library reserves. So uh, again, your professors will have those in the syllabus. If they've got a PDF version, they will share it, don't you worry. And uh, they'll, uh, a lot of them also give you links to where to look on the library's website. You will get used to using it uh, for sure. And once you get used to it, it's a lot easier. Uh, so don't get too intimidated by how many uh, resources are available on there. And uh, Ben also mentioned that if the professors uh, send out the syllabus late-ish. Uh, that would be end of August, early September. The CU Learn courses will be opening up and you should be receiving the syllabus. Uh, that was a question from yesterday as well. So uh, he kind of answered that for, for me. <laughs> so that's perfect. Uh, Erica in the chat, for media production and design, what kind of devices and software are needed for the program? And this uh, is our last question of the day. First thing I know is if you have a MacBook, I'm not sure it's quite good for the programming part of the courses. I know I had friends who had MacBooks and they didn't I have work. MacBook. Yeah. Did it work? But it works. Yeah. It's just um, for programming because it's a lot simpler on Windows, just in regards to the programs mm -hmm. you have, like note notepad, like it's easier. Other than, like I don't think there's anything you need. The I know that Adobe uh, Creative Cloud. You so, like, you need okay. Creative Cloud mm -hmm. for second year for sure. But I know that the profs have been working with Adobe and with the school to figure out how they can get like everybody access to it during class time. I know that while we were in class there, we used for students who didn't want to purchase it, um, used free trials and used um, um, uh, school codes to access it for a short period of time. I did purchase it. I don't regret it. We don't have textbooks for our media production classes. So paying the, the student fee for that wasn't a big deal to me. Um, but I know we are looking into like having the programs available for students. But other than that, you just need a computer that has 
access to, and any computer really does um, have access to programming software like Notepad, which is free. I have a Mac, I used Rackets, which is also free. It, anything really works. You should get an email uh, before, like a couple of weeks before. It basically will tell you like all like the computer details you need to and programs you might need to download. But once school starts, if the teacher tells you to download something, that's usually when. Like we, we, we really didn't know what to download. The teacher said, all right, next week we'll be doing this. So make sure to download this program. Um, also for computer, we all work in computer labs. So if your laptop doesn't work, or even if you don't want to use your laptop, you have computers to use that have all the programs already. Um, and Which will be weird this year, but hopefully. Yeah. So for this one, yeah. So, but you should be getting a, an email with telling all the like, specifics of programs and computer specs you should need. And the school has access to everything. Like in second year, we used a lot of cameras and panoramic photo things, but they're the... I don't know if it's the journalism school or what actually runs it, but um, the school will give you access to almost anything you need. Fantastic. There was a few other questions within the chat about uh, syllabuses will be released again, end of August, beginning September. They will be available on CU Learn. Uh, classes will be through CU Learn and various video conferencing software like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Big Blue Button. It just depends on what the professor is using. So with those last questions, I would like to thank you all for joining us today and sticking around for those final three minutes over time. Uh, but it was very helpful for me, as I hope it was very helpful for you. Um, and I wish you all the best in your coming academic year. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for being here. See you in different ways in September. Take care. <laughs>